Hey folks, uh, thanks for coming all here to my talk and being interested in MemXC stuff. Uh, I assume some of you may heard about that term before in the past. Can you raise your hands. Okay, so for those of you who don't, um, MemX is a concept that has been populated um, or made popular by Vannevar Bush. He was a scientist uh, from the mid 20th century and he envisioned a device that would let you to let you organize, connect and share your knowledge. Uh, back then it was on microfilm, um, obviously not really feasible uh, from a hardware point of view, but now we're in a the, in the stage where we can do that and so we started to build um, what um, what what uh, Vanneva wants to build, hopefully. <clears throat> so, who of you knows th these problems? Please raise your hands and let them uh, let them up if you're still in it. Okay. <laughs> okay, let them up. Who who of you knows this problem when trying to to save stuff? <laughs> and who of you knows this problem? <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. Then you probably like what we're, what I'm about to show you. So the thing is, uh, when we're thinking about uh, our knowledge, <coughs> then the way our brain stores information is always contextual to other things. So when you're looking at, for example, um, that article that you saw while browsing in the back rows of a talk uh, at FOSDEM, uh, you remember some words from that article, you remember the date, you remember it was at an event, but these are not the things we can search for. And that's because the way our software currently is structured doesn't allow the kind of fluid associative memory to be taken advantage of that we have, right? Like if we think about it, we use 15th century tools to organize the kind of 21st century digital knowledge. So we first had libraries that were very siloed, so you had to go to a library and find a book. Then you had to go to in the digital age, you had to go to organizations like Facebook, like your knowledge management, task management, your Google search, everything is disconnected. So it's basically like a library again. But what we think is the future is connected knowledge. And you may have heard also about an application called Notion before. Uh, who of you has used that? One person? Oh, it's a really, really great tool uh, because it allows you to connect knowledge and data, data objects uh, with each other in a very, um, customizable way because it is so connected. And what Notion is for kind of wikis, knowledge management in that regard, we want to do for web research. So let me show you how that works in practice. So now I'm reading this article. This is the article, by the way, about Memex, the original concept, not ours. Um, and what do I remember? I maybe remember the word recollection, right? So I had no chance to find this again if I just remember that word. I could re-Google it maybe, but that take, takes so much time. So what you can do with Memex is you type in W space into the address bar, the browser, the word recollection, and then you have all the results from every website that you visited with that word in it. Uh, you can also say, please show me everything after like 20 minutes ago and filter by time. You have also an overview where you can, for example, tag stuff. Um, you can sort it into collections. Because not needing to organize doesn't mean you can't. Obviously, you need to have some sort of flexibility in terms of how you organize your knowledge. The second issue that the tool tackles is one of note taking. So we all know whenever we take notes about the web stuff we see, we have to copy paste it out. We have to use the web clipper and make a snapshot of the page in Evernote and then write some inline text and you cannot share it, you cannot reuse it, it's, it's locked into this data silo again. So what you can do here is, I, you already saw the little tooltip, you can just highlight any piece of text and add notes to it. And another thing that you might also encounter constantly, uh, specifically if you're into like journalistic uh, or doc writers for open source projects, that you want to show people specific pieces of an article and not the whole thing. 
So right now you need to copy paste out that specific section and then you need to copy paste again the URL. The other person needs to do the whole shading again. So what you can do is you can just highlight any piece and click on the second button that you saw. It's maybe a bit too low. I'm, I'm putting it up here. So, so here. Now hopefully the internet works. Because, yeah, for, oh yeah, okay, it worked. So, now you get a link that you can share with anyone. Uh, and this is what happens. You can really quickly link stuff with just a click, basically. So, um, that's the current state. That's actually my production version. That's my private Memex. Uh, you can download that already. Uh, you go on this website. If the internet loads, worldbrain.io. If you want to do that, I, I'll repeat it later again if you like. <clears throat> so, really important. Um, this tool is obviously, because I'm here at FOSTEM, entirely open source, and also we value data ownership and privacy a lot. So we designed this application to be offline first. And it runs by default all on your computer. No data is sent to any server except you want to share stuff. Then there obviously other people get specific access to specific subdata. Um, for the linking, we... <laughs> Hello? Um, maybe the cable? I'll try it again. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Heart attack moment, huh? Uh, <laughs> Maybe I should disable flux or so. Okay. But I think it works out. Just don't touch it. <laughs> Just don't touch it. Um, yeah. So all all your data is stored locally, and if we make these links, we, for example, only store the highlighted text, uh, the URL, but no IPs. Who gets it? We have, we actually never looked into the database of those links uh, before. We really don't want to analyze any of your data. And that's also really important for the kind of business approach we have because it's a for-profit project. We try to build a SaaS model out of it. Um, but we intentionally don't take venture capital um, because we know that if we want, once we do that, we would at some point need to sacrifice your data. It's inevitable because we, for, this, for the sake of growth, that is required to have a venture-backed business, we at some point need to build lock-ins. We need to somehow monetize this huge chunk of data that is potentially on our servers for the sharing services. Um, so that's not what we want to do. Instead, we use a model that is called steward ownership. Um, you can also read about that on our website, which is basically a way of incentivizing collaborators and investors with um, some sort of profit-sharing model that doesn't require us to grow in order, like to grow infinitely in order to give people um, a fair share for the risk they're taking. Also, um, cool, thanks. The, the vision of where we want to go is that uh, this Memex is just one Memex. Like it is really like every person on this planet has a completely different um, way of doing knowledge management. Everyone uses different apps that they want to connect with each other. Everyone has different workflows. So we really want to enable a whole ecosystem of Memex devices that can be adapted to different workflows. So a developer might use a different Memex than a student, than a journalist, than an entrepreneur. Um, and that's also a reason why we don't take venture capital, is to be able to say, hey, the ecosystem can generate 95% plus of the wealth, of the revenue, of the users in the ecosystem, and we would still be OK. Uh, because we don't need to grow infinitely in that ecosystem. So yeah, interoperability is at the core of what we do. Um, means you can easily switch to another Memex um, and modify it and do whatever you want. You're not locked into our services. On that note, what we launched this week is the ability to back up and restore your data to any cloud provider. So we have built a little local server app for all main operating systems. 
uh, that would allow you to basically upload the backup um, to, to all cloud providers that have a local file system integration. Um, so you stay full control, in full control of your backups too, if you like to do that. But obviously you can also choose Google Drive. So, like that's for the majority is, of people. Is the data encrypted or we have to do it ourselves? Uh, we haven't done that yet, um, for priority reasons. We're a relatively small team, um, so, but it's on our roadmap. Uh, and when we have, um, for the syncing, for the syncing, the kind of relay, um, because we offer like uh, asynchronous syncing, then we encrypt it on travel. Um, but it will be deleted after it's synced. So. Does it also support holding uh, um, backup to own server without some cloud uh, provider? So it's it's ba possible on the basis of that we haven't implemented it yet, but it's it's um, thought about to just point to a server, have some authentication, uh, and just say make a append uh, append only backup log there. So that's possible um, with a little bit of contribution. That's certainly possible. Yeah. So yeah, and then the next step for us um, is peer-to-peer -peer sync um, between your devices. Uh, means you can have, yeah, you can also use it on mobile phone. Uh, what we offer then as a service is to say for everyone who doesn't want to run a server or doesn't know who, how to run a server, uh, we do it for them. And for everyone who's, who knows that and wants to be independent, they can host their ho ho uh, own handshake server, signaling server to make the peer-to-peer -peer sync possible. For that, we also developed a, um, a library um, that we call Storex, which is um, a library that would allow us to gradually replace our backend infrastructure. So for example, we may think to implement an IPFS backend or a DOT backend to, to make more distributed um, sharing possible. Um, and so because we're not sure yet which one of those to take, we have built this kind of modular um, database abstraction ecosystem for JavaScript. Please check it out, um, and maybe it's useful to you too. Which brings us to another next step that we're doing, um, that is collaboration. And so that's also the initial premise of the talk, is how do we actually be able to collaborate more in our web research? Because right now there are so many limitations because our data is also locked up, and it's very hard to reshare information because for one, you need to re-Google it, right? Then you need to find all your notes that are relevant to it that you may have left in a chat log somewhere or in another note-taking application or in an email thread. And so it becomes so scattered that it's very hard to share. And so one of the, like these are the three features that we're focusing on. And for example, the first one, co-curation of collections, means that you can create these folders that you then can share with other people and collaborate in curating them. This might be useful for entrepreneurs uh, to do some customer research or for journalists to do the story research together. So, hey, this is all the stuff that I read about climate change. Uh, here, please, you can look through it and you can also full text search through them. So that's part of the publishing collections. You can basically say, maybe as a thought leader, like a term, like someone who, who likes to share knowledge and who likes to share thoughts, uh, maybe uh, giving them the ability to say, look, here's the thousand articles that I ever read about climate change, and I, I don't want to just share a list. You can discover what, I, what I've um, searched for or like what I, what I looked at, for example, by just typing, oh, what did this guy say about um, ocean acidification? and then basically being able to search in this kind of shared subset of his knowledge or her knowledge, plus all the annotations that this person has um, left there and wanted to share with the community or peer to peer. There is no central, central um, platform. It's really you share it with your people and your tribe and you find other people that you want to look into that, like into the knowledge of those other people too. And the last point is um, annotation threads, so having conversations, like really responding to annotations and highlights that people have made inside an article to exchange thoughts about that and be very precise about this. So yeah, um, I wanted to end the talk a bit early, perfect, because I wanted to give a bit of room for questions because it may be that it's a bit complicated. So, so please. Uh, yes, sir. So, is 
a federation built in or on the roadmap? Because if I have my Mehmet instance and I have all my annotations, then uh, if I uh, and others want to annotate also, but they don't know how to set it up, they can come to me, but then the data becomes centralized on my node. So is there any way for nodes to communicate? So the thing is, that's also the reason why we built Storex. Uh, in the beginning, we might have to start more centralized because it's, it's very difficult to build a federated system that at the end is useful to non-technical audiences. And so um, because our tool is, is made for developers but not exclusively, um, we probably start with more centralized ways. Then thinking about how we make data interoperable. So for example, by using a distributed hash table like Dup does it. So that addressability, um, that might be a bit technical now, uh, that addressability um, becomes interoperable, but the <coughs> authentication server might be more centralized. Um, so we need, to fi we need to figure that out still. I don't have a definite answer. But it's, on our, it's in our interest to make the system as interoperable and for the user as free to move as possible. I was wondering about this uh, um, working together on the same knowledge. Um, you mentioned the collaboration stuff that you want to do, but um, is that production ready? No, it's no. like in the roadmap. Yes. Okay. So before that, as far as I understood, is the server that you set up uh, somewhere, you make it run, and you send data to it, right? No. Is it possible for multiple people to set up the same server, and then they share everything freely, 100%, with no... Potentially, yes. Um, now it's more, right now the version is more on a single player um, focus. So multiplayer with having multiple people on the same server, that would be the difficulty that we're talking about okay. um, because that would mean we have a Mastodon-like system where you need to sign up for a new node to be a, to be yeah. a part of that node and that is difficult um, in a more decentralized collaboration. something for at some level, uh, etc. Uh, does it uh, uh, store the actual the current uh, uh, version of the site or uh, just some metadata and uh, when I look at it uh, after a year and the site uh, so change it uh, meanwhile uh, it did not fit? So what we, yes for, for that use case that would be a, a problem right now so it doesn't, it doesn't persist the page but it's on our roadmap too to make snapshotting possible. And we're gonna work with the Internet Archive. Um, they said, they gave their go that we basically say with every annotation that is done in a certain time frame, we make a snapshot at the Internet Archive and add a link to an alternative snapshot to the page for that particular annotation. So that in any case, you could at least go back to the Internet Archive. And then afterwards um, being able to snapshot it for yourself if you like to but that's the thing is that this space wise uh, yeah, yeah, can get a bit tricky uh, yeah. how far is this on the roadmap to, uh, this year so this year. yeah yeah so uh, it will certainly come before we do the collaboration because there it becomes more important oh. to have a, 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 a central source of truth when you're talking about an article so okay. if, start here, here yeah um, I, uh, I understand that the product is, is still early, like uh, it, there's a lot of things to do, but mm -hmm. I didn't hear like, of, uh, of, uh, of a search engine or to, to, to retrieve all, all the next you can save and like to, 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 to also uh, in the timeline, like for example your reference can change, like you can uh, find the first reference and then another one and the, the, the new one change how you think about the first one, all this kind of, of thing you can, to how you access all your open X, like you can talk about that. Okay, I'm not sure if I understood the question, sorry. Um, uh, how do you search through all the contents you, you connect? How we solve that? You search. But you search, how you search all the, all the contents. So with the technology underneath, or? Yeah. Ah, yeah, so we, we built a, a search layer on top of Dexy.js. Um, that it r runs in the browser. Uh, it's a custom search engine. Um, and that right now we tested about 200,000 articles and it didn't have, m like, it has a little bit of flow down but not m measurable. But you didn't have down any specific word on, on, on this? On oh, no, no, I didn't do anything. It, uh, every website you visit is automatically indexed in the background and 
Yeah, if you have a decent fast computer, you don't feel it at all. It will be slower. Okay, uh, him, him because he was yeah. for you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, to export it. it. We are actually use uh, Hypothesis yeah. Annotation Client. So okay. it's, a, it's the same library. It's n we don't export it yet uh, in, as an open annotation data model, but it's planned to do so, yeah, totally. Oh. Yeah, it's a browser extension, but we ha I haven't tested it on Chrome OS. Because the device which are used only for browsing, it's easy. If 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 a Chrome extension works on Chrome OS, it should work. Yeah, um, just, just back end it runs it inside of the browser, it shouldn't be a problem. I guess so. We haven't just packaged for it yet. Okay. Cool. Yeah. yeah. It's Firefox. All browsers that support a web extension um, okay. standards. So. Cool. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.